this talk is as much about designing studies as it is about the substantive research findings that I find. So even if you don't care how persuasive neuroimages are or are not to juries, that's okay because uh, here, here are the methodological lessons that you might find interesting. How do you design a study that is capable of zeroing in on the effect that you are totally interested in and not be fooled by subtle confounds? The answer is the generous use of control groups. At least that was the answer we came up with. Um, and then when it starts to look like there is no effect, what can you do to make your non-effect findings, I don't mean make them, to, to guard against as many alternative explanations for your non-findings as you can guard against so that the editors and the reviewers will say, yeah, I think, I think you're right. There is no there there, and we will publish your article anyway. Um, the, um, w you, you mentioned Mike Gazzaniga. He, a few years ago, when he was the head of the Law and Neuroscience Research Network, which was funded by the MacArthur Foundation, we, and he's passed that job on to Owen Jones, who I guess was here mm -hmm. last, last year ago. So Owen Jones is now the head of that. Uh, so you know, you probably knew this without knowing anything about them. FMRI is all the rage, and since they were doing law and neuroscience, and they, I don't know, did they mention, they must have mentioned who the, mm -hmm. neuro, the research network is. It's psychologists and neuroscientists and philosophers and lawyers. Um, and they're all very interested about what FMRI can do. And one of the things they decided they were interested in was how influential is our, our neuroimages, FMRI neuroimages, to juries. Uh, so they asked me, uh, and I asked uh, a, co a couple of colleagues of mine to get involved in it. Um, so let me say what the applied concern, oh, you know what, I should have put up who paid for this research and who are the various co-authors? Yeah. All right. Do you mean it doesn't matter whether it's valid or not? Are the juries influenced by mm. it or, or that it does matter? Well. This man understands evidence. <laughs> well, that is a great question. You can and influence people with yes. invalid stuff. So, okay. We avoided trying to answer that, though we knew that at bottom what we were hoping to do was to see whether the influence exceeded the information contained in it. So if we, and I think we kind of dealt with that. As you will see, we give jurors through verbal testimony all the neuro information they need to have. Now we show them a picture that doesn't tell them anything that they didn't already learn from the verbal information. So if adding the picture shoots up the persuasiveness, we could at least say uh, it, it is pushing them a lot farther than the words did. Or other, we have other ways of communicating that information and is the image of the brain uh, doing more work. Now you might say, well they didn't understand it before, now they see the picture, ah, they get it. So that's a very tricky problem. I didn't want to sidetrack you, I just wanted to know what to listen for. But that's, uh, so we're, we, we, I don't know if we'll answer that one uh, definitively. Um, so here's the research question, and I underlined things that I think are very important because there are other studies that didn't quite look at those things. So if what the MacArthur network cared about most was neuroimages from fMRI brain scans, not anatomical injuries, brain scans of those, offered through expert testimony. Uh, are they inordinately persuasive? 
which kind of takes us back to your question. Um, and does that lead to wholesale acquittals in criminal trials? Or, uh, putting it really briefly, do neuroimages bowl the jury over or not? Uh, and I must tell you that when we first came onto this, many people in the literature and in the MacArthur network were pretty sure or pretty worried that you hold up a picture of a brain and the jury says, whatever you say, we'll, we'll vote that way. That sounds kind of funny in retrospect, since we didn't find that. Um, but um, what we, um, I guess one, one of our findings is that neuroscientists believe in the power of images more than jurors do. Uh, and one reason they were, they thought that this was probably true was there had, there had been some past research which at least hinted at it. Uh, and the research kind of suggested the power of the neurological, uh, even to the point of calling it neurobabble. You just babble some neuro at people and they believe whatever you're telling them. Uh, it is, after all, the brain. And once you see it's the brain, then it's got to be whatever they say it is. Or sometimes they say it's the power of the visual. Seeing the brain is different from anything else you can learn about what's going on in the brain. Um, or in some sense, it's real. Even though neuroimages, fMRI images, as many of you may know, are highly, I don't know, manufactured products of statistical manipulations of different complicated things that I don't know a lot about since I'm not a neuroscientist. Um, so, um, but here's a couple of the studies that had people thinking this is really going to be potent stuff. Weisberg et al., Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, uh, in his study they, um, they presented to laypersons, to neuroscience students, taking, students taking classes in neuroscience, um, and experts, I guess other faculty who were neuroscientists or cognitive neuroscientists. They presented them with uh, good versus bad. All these people got presented with good versus bad, illogical explanations of well-established cognitive phenomena crossed by neuro brain-based explanations versus more conventional psychological-based explanations. And what they basically found was that um, on average people could tell a good explanation from a bad explanation, but the bad explanations didn't seem so bad when they were accompanied by neurobabble, by neuro stuff. Uh, that was true of the lay people and the students, though the experts could see that that didn't make the bad explanation any better than it had been. So that suggested that lay people were easily pushed around. In the McCabe and Castell study, they presented people with simulated newspaper clippings which presented stories about new scientific findings. And the findings were either accompanied by brain images uh, to say, see, you, here's, the, here's what we're describing as a new finding, and here's a picture of what's going on in the brain. Uh, or they were accompanied, in, rather than by a brain image, they were shown bar graphs of the data. The same data that was supposed to be in the brain image was now represented in a bar graph or by a stylized topographical brain map, or by no image at all as the control. And they asked people to rate the uh, new scientific findings, how important, how impressive. And lo and behold, when, when it was accompanied by a brain image, it was, wow, that is one heck of a finding. And the Gurley and Marcus study uh, was a simulated insanity defense case 
or several cases, in which they varied the diagnosis. It was either psychopathy or schizophrenia, and they varied the um, onset, the circumstances of the onset of the brain Im injury, and they varied the image uh, showing a physical brain injury or no physical brain injury. Um, and they found that when you showed jurors the brain image, they, the jurors uh, were more likely to find the defendant not guilty by reason of insanity. So um, why don't we just say, well, those studies pretty much answer the question, except if you go back to what we said the original question was, you find that each of them misses the mark in one way or another. The Weisberg study, first of all, involved no images whatsoever, and it was in a non-criminal, non, non, not even legal context. Uh, McCabe and Castell, this was, they were not in a crime, guilt, punishment context, which we think becomes a very important difference. Gurley and Marcus managed to confound the visual and the verbal. When they didn't give the visual, they didn't give the neuroscience expert verbal explanation. So it was a whole package, neuro or a whole package clinical. So we don't know if the visual image was the active ingredient. Uh, and there were other studies, all of them less than uh, perfectly answering our question. So now I'm going to give you an overview of all the experiments that I'm going to talk about. So here's where you will know the answers before I get to them. There are three different sets of studies. The first set is four experiments testing something uh, called the mens rea defense. If you haven't had criminal law, uh, in order to be guilty of a crime, most of the time, the great majority of the time, all common law crimes, you've got to not only perform a prohibited act, you have to have a mental state that is, that combined with it constitute the crime. Mens rea, that's the mental state. So just because some act of yours led to the death of a person does not by itself mean you are guilty of homicide. You gotta have the, the mental state that goes along with that. So by uh, you, this is a very tough hill to get up for a juror. If you're a defense lawyer, they almost never try to use this. What they're, the idea here is you come into court and say, well, yes, my client did cause the death of that innocent person, but my client's brain has a problem which our expert will explain to you, tells you why they could not have formed the requisite criminal intent to be guilty of the crime. And now, how many juries are gonna go along with this? Uh, they say, what, we're gonna let, turn this killer loose because they're not guilty of murder, of intentional, purposeful killing or any other kind, uh, but they did kill somebody. So, uh, but we thought this was a good place to start because if the brain image was so magically powerful that it could produce not guilty verdicts in this context, then it can do anything. Um, so the first four experiments do that. Um, and uh, steep hill to climb. And whenever I give you a finding, I put it in yellow. I'm gonna make this really easy so if you're drifting off, you see yellow come up on the screen? Okay, there's the finding. We found no special power of neuroimages. What that means is whatever impact the neuroimage testimony had, other testimony by other, other neuroscience testimony, other, other cognitive psych testimony, cognitive neuroscience, clinical, had an equal power to have whatever little effect it had. So this is our big null findings experiment. So then we moved on, did one experiment using a more conventional insanity defense. Okay, now we'll just tell you that the defendant is not guilty by reason of insanity and now we're gonna give evidence of the defendant's insanity. Uh, we varied the definition of insanity for the four major legal categories 
Uh, one is the person does not know the nature or quality of what they are doing. Just, this is your image of the completely crazy person who's totally out of touch with reality. Then there's the well-known McNaughton right-wrong test. The person can't distinguish right from wrong. Or the irresistible impulse test, which didn't go over too big uh, in the law. But that's where, oh yes, I know it's wrong to do, but I just can't stop myself from killing or whatever the crime is. Mary Jane Stewart. You needed James Stewart. I needed James Stewart. Oh, 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 oh. Do you remember that movie? Um, Irresistible You know. <laughs> it was a great movie. Which movie is it? I forget the. Oh. I forget the. Uh, I know that. It takes place in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Boy, I must have seen it a long time ago, or not at all. It's but a I'll, movie, I'll get it from Netflix. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> uh, he, did he get the guy off? He did. He did. All right. Well, it's better than a Noro image. Uh, <laughs> James Stewart is better than a Noro image. Uh, now that one I know very well. Or the fourth is guilty but mentally ill, which makes no philosophical or legal sense at all, but it became popular after Ronald Reagan was shot at and the shooter was found not guilty by reason of insanity. So we better change the law. Anyway, um, again, no special power of Noro images. And finally, we move to the penalty phase of a capital trial. And uh, what's happening here is a person has already been found guilty of murder, and it's capital murder, meaning your killing makes you, is under circumstances which make you eligible for the death penalty. And all that the jurors have to decide at this stage of the trial, and all our subjects had to decide was, do you want this person to get the death penalty, or should this person be locked up for the rest of his or her life? Uh, we have two experiments there. Yeah, and you have a murder. Sorry. Don't encourage. That was it. <laughs> Don't encourage. Okay. okay, now I'm going to think of another one. Now I'm going to <laughs> Um, <laughs> we got through 12 angry men, there must be four. <laughs> in this, uh, well, I'm sure I did see that, but uh, faint recollection. Um, the neuroimages in this study finally did something. Uh, and what they did was that they reduced death sentences for defendants diagnosed with psychopathy. So that's where we're headed. Now, now we're going to take the trip. So the first set of studies were in this article in Psychology, Public Policy, and Law. And now, here are, these, here are all these control conditions. This is the target condition. A snazzy, brightly colored, uh, three-dimensional fMRI image accompanying testimony by a neuroscientist explaining what's, what this picture tells us about the defendant's brain. And this is, what I'm going to show you here is applied to the first several, happens, well, basically happens in all the experiments. But um, now, what if it's, so what if we got an effect for that first one? Maybe it's the bright colors. So why don't we have a condition where they're much more muted, kind of a more boring picture. Uh, what if instead of a picture of the brain, we present the same information in a color graph of the brain function? Or what if it's a black, black and white graph of, of brain function? Same information in all of these, but a different image. So that if we got an effect for that bottom one, the bright three-dimensional fMRI, and we didn't get an effect for the others, then we'd know that it's something about the color. Or if we got an effect for the bottom two, which are Noro images, but no effect for the graphs, then we would know it's, it's the brain that's doing it. So we want to be able to sort out by the pattern of results what is, what is really happening. 
what if, what if it's just the verbal testimony of the neuroscientist? So let's have the neuroscientist testify about his brain scans. The brain scans showed me something about this person. I'm going to tell you about it, but I'm not, I'm not going to show you the picture. I'm just going to tell you about it. Same, same verbal information in all of these. But, but we didn't want to not have some picture so that people are seeing something visual but we don't want it to be relevant to the, the testimony. So it's a courtroom. You're going to see the neuroscientist. You're going to see a picture of the courtroom where the trial could take place. What if it's just learning about the brain from tests other than brain images? So we have a clinical neuropsychologist with an image of a courtroom. And what about any kind of mental health expert testimony. So now we have a clinical psychologist giving non-neurological non -neurological diagnosis, personality uh, defect or some, something. I forget, what they, I forget what it was. And last but not least, the pure control condition where there is no expert testimony at all. There's a family member who explains uh, what a messed up kid this person was when they were a kid and how the other kids like to beat him on the head or something. Um, okay, so experiment one, the crime, we've got all those conditions that I just showed you, but the story is here's a crime and the defendant planned to rob a restaurant and wait till people left the restaurant uh, and there, there was he was the last customer left in the restaurant. And then he was going to go up and rob the cashier. And when she resisted his robbery attempt, he hit her and beat her and ended up killing her. The prosecution offers persuasive evidence that establishes that the defendant is the guy who did these acts, who did this killing. Uh, and the jurors are uh, have explained to them the different verdicts they could reach based on what they think is going on in the head of the defendant. They could say he's not guilty. No mens rea. Not guilty. Or maybe they think it's manslaughter or second degree murder or first degree murder. Uh, results. Nothing. No differences. No effects. Nothing. So the first thought you have is, what did I do wrong? And the second thought you have is, well, maybe there's no effect. Uh, when I say no effect, I mean no effect among the expert conditions. Because all the expert conditions have an impact beyond just a family member saying, here's what happened to Johnny. And, and just to double check, you, you didn't have an expert non-neuroscientist condition, or you did? We did. We had a straight clinical psychologist. So these no differences are between the clinical psychologist and all the other experts? All the expert witness conditions, including the clinical psychologist, were able to uh, get a little bit of an improvement. But did the clinical psychologist significantly differ from uh, any of the neuroscientists? In our later studies, there is that difference, that the neuro people had more of an impact than the clinical psychologist. Not yet. Okay. But that does happen. Mm. If, it's, if it's absolutely plainly clear that the person killed the cashier. You but that's not murder. If they are persuaded that he lacked the intent to kill, okay. then it's not the crime, it's not any homicide. For murder in the, I'll work my way up. For manslaughter, you have to have been you have to have recklessly disregarded a conscious risk that your action could kill. For second degree murder, you have to have intended the death or have been extremely reckless. Like if I shoot a the classic example, one classic example, shoot a bullet into a house. I'm not trying to kill anybody, but my bull, I, I'm creating a very great risk, and apparently I don't care whether I kill someone or not. That would get you second-degree murder. First-degree murder is not only do I want to kill, 
but I'm going to think about it. I'm going to plan it out. I'm going to premeditate and deliberate. So what these experts are trying to say is this person's brain is incapable of forming any, any kind of intent to kill. Though obviously the person can think well enough to plan a robbery. I'll sit here, I'll wait until everybody goes away, and I'll rob. Um, so there, there was nothing. Now with experiment two, and what you'll see happening here is we, try to, we start to dial down the severity of the crime. Maybe, um, maybe, so now it's just robbery and assault. No one's getting killed. Maybe people are just so horrified or afraid that they, they just want this person locked up and they don't care about anything. So let's make it something less serious. Same experimental conditions, a little different crime. Results. No special power of neuroimages. Uh, all the expert witness conditions, including the clinical uh, psychologist, um, I think, I think I'm getting this right, uh, uh, produced sentences that were lower or, uh, or verdicts that were lower. But we also asked for sentences. How long would you lock this person up? Uh, but they were lower than the control condition. Um, the, the clinical psychology condition did not produce as much of a lowering as, get this, the neuroscience testimony with a black and white graph. No bra the brain image was not the most potent thing for lowering sentences. The black and white graph was, and it was lower than the clinical psych testimony, but only marginally lower than the other things. Now, we did something else. We did some mediation analysis to see what is mediating any changes in the verdicts and the sentences. And, uh, Satis one concern we had from the first experiment is we did this, you know, I neglected to mention, we did this online, not with Mechanical Turk, but we hired a company. Since we had all this MacArthur money, we could do the Lexus version. We hired a company that obtained a representative sample of jury eligible Americans from around the country who would go to the website and be our mock jurors. And we, uh, and then one of the things we did was give them a quiz to see if they remembered the facts that we had presented to them. And if they didn't score decently, they were kicked out of the experiment. And if they were online for only five milliseconds and answered the questions to get their money, they were kicked off. Uh, I forget the exact cutoffs. If they were on too long, we kicked them out because they might have started in the morning and then went to work and then finished and they came home and can't expect them to remember. So tried to have people who knew what they were doing. But we were still worried that online people don't care, they're not thinking. So the mediation analysis gave us some comfort because what we found was that perceived control was by far the best predictor of the verdicts and the sentences. So that the experimental conditions affected perceived control. So they, they think, when they hear the expert testimony, they think this person can't control his conduct as well as um, the rest of us. Uh, in the control condition, no expert witnesses at all, they think, well, it's just some person who's committing a crime and has plenty of control, just chose not to exercise it. So. Um, but, but though, that, though that did not affect their verdicts and their sentences, uh, it did affect their perception of control and their perception of control had some effect on verdict sentences. So something sensible is going on. Uh, but we knew the journals wouldn't buy just two studies. So now we move to experiment three where we now dial down the, uh, the crime um, the person, the defendant is walking along the street, is inadvertently bumped mildly by a passerby, 
and just flips out and just swings his arm at the person and hits him, uh, maybe knocks him down, but no, no serious injury at all. Um, so um, we added, and we added another dependent variable. You're going to sentence this person to a certain number of years. Uh, where do you want to sentence this person? To a mental health facility, lock them up in a psychiatric facility, or lock them up in a prison? Because we thought maybe that would be more sensitive than our other dependent measures. And in addition to the fMRI, see we're getting desperate by this point. So now we're going to give them a structural defect. Can you see, maybe, if you can't see it, there's a hole in the brain. Uh, an anatomical defect. So if you don't believe there's something wrong with this person's brain, take a look at the picture. Uh, there it is. Uh, and we want to see if that had an impact. So here are the results. Once again, the neuroimages did nothing special compared to other kinds of expert testimony. In the sentences, all of the expert witness conditions, including the plain old-fashioned clinical psychologist, produced lower sentences than the uh, pure control condition. The mediation analysis again showed that perceived control was the best predictor of the sentences people give. And I thought, this is more of an aside than anything else, this was not affected by the neuroimage or any other, that all the expert conditions produced a similar pattern. But on average, 81% of the time to be served on this sentence was to be served in a psychiatric facility. So when you think about the average person in the country, or at least the average person who does these online experiments, if you think of them as some sort of Neanderthals who just want to lock people up and not pay any attention to the circumstances, the person's situation, they wanted, in fact, I'll give you slightly more detailed stuff, 81%, um, where did it go? 81% of the sentence time was to be in treatment uh, and the rest in prison, but only 11% said send the person to a high secure prison. 8% said 8% of that time was in a prison, but a low security, more pleasant prison. So people were willing to accept that there's something very wrong with this person, but, um, but we still want them locked up. Uh, experiment four, now we're really trying to make it as easy as possible for us to get an effect. Because we thought, what do the reviewers and the editors want to see? They want to see that you've made it as easy as you can make it to get an effect, and there's still no effect. So maybe there, this is real. So we, here in, exper in experiment four, we focus on anatomical injury, not functional. We're giving up only a hole in the brain. We removed the family history the, the lay testimony entirely, thinking maybe the jurors are turned off by this. This is a family member who's making a case for this guy, and maybe they were offended by that, and there was some reactance, and they said, you know, screw this, we're gonna, so let's just get that out of there altogether. Again, the crime is very impulsive, there's no thought about it, uh, just suddenly uh, the uh, person um, the person um, is bumped and gets, uh, gets upset and hits. Um, and we included, I don't know why, I forget why we did this. We included a condition where the finding is, look, the brain image shows a normal person. He can't use his uh, mens rea excuse. We added another condition. We're still trying to get some effect to show that people are reacting when there's something to react to. 
There's a finding in the literature that if you show jurors a photo, mock jurors, a photograph of the injury victim with his cut nose and a little blood and messed up, uh, even if it's a minor injury, show a picture of that, the convictions and the sentences go up. So we wanted to see if we could replicate that effect. So um, here, here are the results. Again, no special power of neuro images. So here's, here's the neuro image with the damage uh, that's supposed to be the magic, wonderful condition. And every one with the blue lines around them are the other neuro conditions. And, this, and the reason I put this in a broken line is this is the normal brain. Why didn't that one shoot way up? Uh, they say, oh, this person's normal. There's nothing wrong with them. Let them, you know, throw the book at them. Um, but none of these conditions differ. Whoops. Anything, this one and those with the blue lines around them, do not differ from each other. Um, the, one, the conclusion I'm tempted to draw from what this condition didn't do is that all this neuro stuff is a lot of mumbo jumbo to the jurors. They're not even getting that this, even though they're told this shows a normal brain, they're not picking up on the significance of that, the, the meaning of that. But in any event, the neuro image showed no difference among What did he say? Um, I'm not going to remember it off the top of my head, but he's saying the same thing in every condition, except in the normal condition, he's telling them that the finding is that, uh, as far as we can tell, this person's brain is as normal as anybody's. But in the others, it's that you know we found an anatomical defect of this type, and it's in the frontal lobe, and that. Uh, that would lead to a person lacking control over their behavior, something along those lines. Um, the neuro image did produce milder verdicts, they're lower, than these two conditions. So, Valerie, you're waiting for this one. So here's the clinical psychology not doing any better than the control and the neuro stuff is better. This one is significantly lower than that, and um, I think some of the others are marginally lower. But uh, for our purposes, the really important thing is that the brain image is not producing magic. Um, ah, and now, when we look at the condition where we throw in a picture of the victim, notice it shoots up, just like the literature has found. So our subjects are behaving like subjects in other studies. So they're not ignoring what's going on. So that was a big comfort to us. Uh, the mediation analysis, again, perception of control, and the R squared was 0.45, which is pretty good. There was a, there were several, yeah, we just asked them, but there was a, I think a three, there were three different questions that asked them about their judgment of this person's ability to control himself. And we combined those into a single index. And it had a Cronbach's alpha of 0.84, the index. Um, pardon? There is an effect of neuro. There's not a special effect of the image. Because the, at least not on the, uh, um, it, with the neuro graph, they're hearing the verbal explanation, they're seeing a bar graph. That, dis that reflects what was supposedly in the, uh, yeah. And that's no different from the brain image. And, it, and it's not different from the neuro, although the bar is higher, they're not statistically different 
the, the neuro no, the no image, the neuro no image is, um, is not statistically different from that. I mean, what, what we thought we would see if something, if the, nor, if the brain image had a magical power to make jurors go along with whatever you wanted to say, we thought that the, uh, let's see, mean verdict rating higher is guiltier. We thought that neuro, that one at the extreme right, would come way down while, all, while the others would go up in some sequence. It seems it's having, it's making up in Uh, no latency. Oh, right. Oh, right. No, no, yes, yes. Yes, that's true. So, neuros actually, I think our, well, our conclusion is that all the expert conditions do something, and the neuro conditions do more. But the neuro with brain image does nothing additional over and above those other things. So there are effects. And indeed, um, I think having effects helps. Because if you're just getting total noise, the reviewers would say, this is just a lot of noise. How do we know anything's happening? So maybe, maybe I'm not clear, but given that the neuro normal seems to have the same effect mm -hmm. as standards, and I'm assuming the normal is when they say there's nothing wrong with this person. Right. They say there's nothing wrong with this person's brain, uh, and so I would have expected that to lead. That why isn't that like the control group? They're just confirming with the control condition. They're kind of they're assuming this person's normal. The neuronormal condition neurologically confirms normalcy. Why didn't this go up? Uh, so either it's a mystery or my, I think at this point I can't call it anything but speculation. My speculation is they're hearing just a lot of unfamiliar talk with big words and they're, it's not having a lot of meaning. Although it's got enough meaning that it's leading them to say to suppress, le to suppress it's all their, it's all yeah. but it might just be neurobabble. Pardon? Verdict, is that one five? Verdict, uh, that is a, uh, a funny index of the very, it's, it's um, ranging from one to two point on that scale. It's going from one to 2.4. The more se severe the uh, verdict, you know, is this, is this aggravated assault? Is it simple assault? Is it not guilty? So one is not so, guilty and three is aggravated Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Um. Did you ever look at uh, just somebody telling the jury, like, uh, like a control, or one of the controls, that the person had perceived that, that information that looked like they had perceived control, and then adding a neural image <coughs> to that? Um. In other words, would the neural image have more effect if it was a perceived control? Verbal, uh, oh, stuff. no, we never had an expert. Well, the expert said when you have damage to this part of your brain, you lack no, control. I mean, normal, normal. But no, no, no. Didn't. Well, the brain they saw when it was neuronormal, they saw a normal brain yeah, without a hole but it in wasn't it. A, a control of, of information that was given to you. This person had control. Um, it, no. No, no, I guess not. That this, no. Then we took all four of those experiments and ran them as a meta-analysis, at least using those conditions which are common to all of them. Uh, we ended up with 1,374 participants. 
And these are the six core experimental conditions. It's pretty much the things you've been hearing about. And now, what did the meta-analysis show? On verdicts, no difference among the expert evidence conditions. Um, but the control condition much came down harder on the person. But the, experiment, the expert witness conditions didn't change things too much. On, that was on verdicts. On sentences, no differences between any conditions when they came to sentencing. Uh, significant overall effect of experimental conditions on the perception of responsibility. But as you can see, the neuroimage isn't doing any better. So this is, a, yeah, this is overall effect. Uh, yeah. But just again, the neural effect is still there, though, as opposed to the image effect. Right, right, right. So summary of this experiment, these four experiments, um, and this will be as much methodological as the findings, you know the findings. We were concerned that the crime that we started out with evoked too much revulsion or fear, so we kept lowering it, lowering it, lowering it, make it milder. Uh, we were concerned that online methods led to non-thinking indifferent res uh, respondents, so we ran mediation analyses. We added the DV about the disposition of the defendant. We replicated the victim image effect, and those all uh, showed that people were paying attention and thinking. Uh, the meta-analysis boosted the power for still not getting an effect. Uh, that's more convincing. Bottom lines, no special impact of neuroimages. All forms of expert testimony accomplish something better than not having expert testimony. And this is especially true of the neuro-based expert testimony. So that's it for those. These next ones will go faster because there's less of them. Uh, so here's the insanity defense one. So mens rea defense, forget it. Let's try good old-fashioned insanity. Uh, this was partly aimed at clarifying the Gurley and Marcus study, which I told you confounded the verbal testimony with the image, so we're going to not do that. We did one experiment with 1,170 people. The crime is that the neighbor, these two people are neighbors, the defendant's in his house, his neighbor next door is working in his yard, maybe he's mowing the lawn or something, I forget what it was. A small stone gets thrown against the defendant's window, He's enraged and comes out and assaults his neighbor. Doesn't do any serious harm. We learned our lesson. Um, the design is a six by four. Um, we have different, we have f familiar different neuroimage and control conditions. And we've got the four insanity defense conditions. And here's and we went to um, neuroimage, neuro and we're doing physical. It's not functional MRI. It's we're back. We've got our physical hole in the brain picture. Uh, and what do we find? No, again, no superior impact of the neuroimage. These. All of these neuro conditions are doing pretty much the same work. Um, and uh, no significant difference among those. And the uh, clinical psych is significantly less impactful than the neuros. And of course, the control condition is least of anything. Uh, uh, again, perceived control was the overwhelming predictor of the verdict to find the person not guilty by reason of insanity or guilty. Uh, perceived control was really big. And now, now I'm switching from my various neuro conditions to, if in case you're curious about the different definitions of insanity, uh, 
the uh, guilty but mentally ill, the irrational, the law's irrational alternative allows jurors to find more not guilty, well, guilty. That's what does, they're allowed to say guilty, but he's crazy, so send him to a mental hospital. Uh, and that is significantly, that produces significantly more defense-oriented verdicts than the other three. Um, and that was that study. So, so far, uh, that's another null study for neuroimages. Again, neuroimages did nothing special, though, your point, the neuro, the neuro testimony did do something, but it's, yeah, go ahead. I, you mean like is the irresistible impulse significantly lower? I don't think it was. I, uh, or I would have made a bigger deal out of it. I mean, I don't remember specifically, but I think when I was putting this together, I would have if I had something to say about it. Unless people hate the test. You mean you're telling me this person knows right from wrong but there's something wrong with him so he can't control himself. Well, that may be true, but, uh, but he makes me nervous. So I want to make sure he's locked up. Um, did you ask about dangerousness in these studies too? Um, not until the next experiment. Okay. Um, but, uh, let, me, let me see if I'm forgetting something. Um, mm, only marginally, uh, the others, okay, wait, 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 wait. Guilty but mentally ill significantly differed. Oh, even that tall bar was significantly different only from irresistible impulse. It was marginally significant, even with our big N from the other insanity conditions. And now the best news, maybe, for those who wanted uh, to see the images do something. So now we're in the sentencing phase of capital cases. Um, what happens in this sentencing phase is that the guy's been convicted and it's like a whole new mini trial. And it's all about mitigating evidence. I gather you do these. We teach a course. So some of you know more about it than I do. But basically, the prosecution brings in aggravating factors. What are the factors that should lead you to decide that this person has got to be executed? And the defense brings in mitigating factors and uh, the jury's asked to balance these things and reach a verdict. Um, we did two experiments with 825, 882 good subjects in them. I'm gonna talk about them as if it's only one experiment. I'm gonna combine it. Um, so the diagnosis, we varied the diagnosis. Uh, a third of the people learned that the diagnosis was psychopathy, a third heard schizophrenia, and a third were told normal. The testing shows a normal mind, normal brain. The expert conditions, uh, clinical, now we have genetic. We have an expert, a genetics expert who says the genetic testing, because apparently this is, this is done in these cases. We're gonna show you this person comes from a long line of crazed killers. And it's in his genes and he really can't be held responsible for it. So we had one of those conditions. And then we had our neuro without an image and our neuro with an image. And now we have expert testimony to the effect that our testing suggests this person uh, has a propensity to dangerousness whether in or out of prison, which is a major reason to decide to execute a person in spite of the fact they'll be locked up. Um, 
so we have high low future dangerousness and we also varied who proffers the expert evidence is it the prosecution or is it the defense the defense can come in and say look uh, based on the expert testimony my clients messed up and uh, you should cut him a break the prosecution can come in with the same evidence and say look this person is screwed up there's no way they'll be able to control him in prison he can't control himself he's really dangerous kill him fry him execute him um, and the major dependent measure is do you, do you recommend life or do you recommend death? Can life be served in a mental health facility in this I don't think we asked about that here. But, uh, so, but you know, in these experiments, you could kind of do anything you want. And once the person is in the prison system, if we can speak about what goes on out there instead of in our experiments, if a person has a mental health issue, at least in theory, they can be assigned to a psychiatric facility to serve their term. Uh, but that's a whole other, whether they have those things, uh, the money for them is another issue. It was always the defense. This is the first time we're going to let the prosecution, because again, we're trying to, uh, we're trying to capture the major ingredients of what goes on in these hearings. So here are the findings. Uh, you're looking at a graph of sentences. The dashed line is the control condition. So right away you can see, now for some reason, people seem to get this better. Because as you can see, the person who is found healthy is, they're, they're, the sentencing is just like uh, let's see, we've got 0 0.6, uh, 2 and a half, uh, 62, 60, let's call it 62% are sentencing to death and the rest life. And um, it doesn't, well, and why should it? Whether they're seeing a neuroimage or just hearing about it when they're told healthy person, healthy brain, okay, execute him. Um, now, the part that makes, um, and by the way, a uh, couple of our co-authors on this were, neuro, were, were uh, cognitive neuroscientists, psychologists who do neuro stuff, Kent Keel being the major one, who does uh, test people, does testify in these cases about psychopathy. That's his thing. So he was really, cons in fact, he talked us into doing the study because he wanted to know, is this having any effect? Um, and lo and behold, for psychopaths, the neuroimages, the lighter gray, the neuroimage reduces death sentences from 62% down to 48 or thereabouts. So it is having an effect. But here are the schizophrenics. Here the effect is reversed. And there is a definite statistically significant interaction between diagnosis and image, no image. So this is a major mystery. Why do the schizophrenics, uh, when you show them the image, show them the brain image, more, ex more of them get executed. So if you are the neuro expert. But the baseline for conviction yeah. in non-neuro is lower. Than right. Right. So probably uh, if, oh. got, if, the, if hmm. the image shows me I've got a hole in the brain, I'm going to say, well, my natural belief that I might be able to cure this person with a lot of melaril, um, hmm. no, they got a hole in the brain. So maybe I'm going to sentence them more often. Natural well, black our jurors didn't hear about treatment. Yeah, they're, just jurors. they're just lay people all out in the world. Uh, and you know, if you also notice, the psychopaths on average are being executed at a higher rate than the schizophrenics on average. 
So um, now, so maybe it's that um, there's some kind of habituation, sort of like habituation, where you're way up, you're up here for them, you're down lower for them, and when you learn something new and important, you moderate. But you look at but, the height of the two black bars for the healthy and the psychopaths, I mean, what jumps out is psychopathy is just not a mitigating factor. Ah, yes. Uh, Merely being a psychopath is doing nothing. That's, that's right. Um, so we just said this. Uh, and although it's not visible on this graph, um, this is sort of Valerie Hans's issue. When experts opined that the defendant was dangerous, more executions. Um, now, this is another, I thought, amazing finding. At least for the psychopaths. I'm not ready to stand behind any of the schizophrenic findings. They're too weird. But for the psychopaths, when an image was presented as part of the evidence, the jurors moved in the direction urged by counsel. Now, what that means is if the prosecutor said, look at this Noro image. That supports my argument that he should be executed, jurors went higher for execution. When the defense said, look at this image, this supports my argument that he, he can't control it, it's not his fault, cut him a break, let him live out his life in prison, jurors went along with that. But when any other kind of support was offered, clinical psych testimony, genetic, or the no image neuro evidence, it moved people further away from what the lawyer was arguing. So the lawyer, the, the lawyer's argument in conjunction with this other evidence was producing a boomerang effect or a backfire effect. They were getting the opposite movement than they were seeking to get. The only time they were getting the jury to go where they wanted them to go was with the image. So, to wrap it all up, what do I think all of this stuff means? Um, I think it has proven that laypersons are not as fascinated with neuroimages as neuroscientists are. Um, indeed, I think they have a lot of trouble making head or tail out of them. And it's just confusing, unfamiliar stuff. However, the neuroimage, the nor strike the word image, the neuro evidence did affect people's judgments of sentence, verdict, perception of responsibility. But those judgments did not affect verdicts until the capital case. So only those final two experiments with the uh, death penalty did it, did it make a difference. Now, I want to tell you why I think some of this stuff. Um, though am I there yet? Why did it not affect verdicts or sentences until the capital case? And here's my, here's the answer I would offer. Um, people understand basically what they're being informed about, but their number one concern is crime control. So they're saying, oh, you, you mean, so think back to the first experiment. Here's this guy who decides to rob a restaurant and ends up killing the cashier. And yes, I understand you telling me, and maybe I see that I hear the neuro evidence and I see the image and I understand, or the graphs and all. I understand you're telling me he can't, he did it, but he can't really understand what he's doing. And you want me to just let him go? No, no way. I want this person locked up where the rest of us will be safe. So I think that uh, in, until, we get to the, uh, until we get to the capital punishment one, people are 
ignoring the uh, ignoring the law and if they were if they were computers and you programmed them to follow the legal rules and they credited the expert testimony they'd have to say some of them would have to reach the conclusion not guilty because mens rea did not exist um, so, uh, but they're not doing that. They're actually carrying out their own social engineering. We're going to lock this person up where he can't do any harm. When they, when they get to the capital punishment studies, now their problem about public safety is already solved. This person's been convicted. They're guilty. They're going to be locked up for the rest of their lives, or they're going to be executed. So now it kind of liberates them to say, well, okay, my public safety concerns are satisfied. Now I can think about justice, mercy, responsibility, and give this person his just desserts. I think that's what I think, at least for psychopaths that worked. And then and I think further evidence of that is prison versus treatment facility. Because the same people who were saying, guilty, lock him up, were also saying, but I appreciate that this person uh, is screwed up in the head and there's nothing they can do about it. This wasn't their fault, so I want them to get treatment. And I, so that's a, they're able to, at that, once they know they're going to be locked up, again, they're able to think about under what conditions do I want them locked up for the benefit of now, I'll do something for the benefit of the defendant. So, um, and now the schizophrenics who went the other way, where the image led to more death, I, you know, I'm just mystified. And if anybody has an explanation or wants to do a study to test some hunches, uh, please do. I, I'm not going to. I'm retiring from. <laughs> I'm retiring from uh, schizophrenia and the death penalty. Oh, and another thing that I think is going on, that I think these data suggest, especially, uh, especially the death penalty part of it, is that the jurors do not believe the. They're skeptical. They're skeptical about the testimony. Some expert gets on. I mean, imagine this. You're a jury. You hear about some crime. This guy killed somebody. He's, it was a sufficiently, the circumstances were sufficiently serious that he's eligible for the death penalty, which not every murder is. Uh, and now you say to me, this poor fellow uh, has something called psychopathy, and his brain is a little funny, and he can't, uh, he has no conscience. He feels no guilt. Uh, and, and you want me to cut him a break? I don't even know if I believe it. So they're, they're very skeptical of that. And I think what the neuroimage did in that one was to show that it's real, that, that, that they couldn't remain as skeptical when you don't just have some tests that a psychologist gives, but you have a picture of a brain. So now I think the things that were being said that I talked about very early on about the why people thought the brain image would be so influential. Here, I think it is working because it overcomes that skepticism. Uh, and hearing from a geneticist didn't do it. Hearing from a neuroscientist who doesn't show you the picture didn't do it. Hearing from a clinical psychologist didn't do it. Uh, and in fact, it pushed people the other way. So there I think, I'm. My best hunch is you're getting some reactants. You're trying to persuade me to cut this person a break because of your highfalutin theories. And I'm going to react against that and go the other way. And only the neuroimage was able to overcome that. So at least if you're a fan of neuroimages, it has that happy ending. I forget why I put an asterisk on that. Um, so, um, the end. <laughs>